Welcome to Span 312 Hopscotch, survey of Latin American literature in translation. And today, once again, coming back, <laughs> I'm extraordinarily pleased and happy to have Ryan Long, who is professor at the University of Maryland, uh, author of uh, a lot of work on Mexican literature, uh, also uh, this book uh, from last year, Queer Exposures on uh, Roberto Bolaño. And we're going to be talking about Bolaño today, specifically uh, this book, Distant Star. So, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for doing this again. And um, my first question is always the open one of how would you suggest uh, approaching this text? All right. Well, great. It's great to be uh, here again. Thank you, John. Um, lovely to see you and looking forward to this conversation. Um, I think... Two general ways to approach this text would be um, to talk about the topic of and perhaps practice of crime fiction in relation to Bolaño's work. Um, you have perhaps his most famous novel, at least in the United States, if not elsewhere, which is called The Savage Detectives. Um, and then you have this novel, Distant Star, which is about um, very specific murders and specific crimes and the more general um, and no less horrible for that reason, chain of state crimes that in some ways the novel suggests go back to colonial period um, with wars against the Mapuche um, perpetrated by the Spanish. And later on in the novel, of course, you have the character of Abel Romero, who is a private detective for hire meant to seek out the most important single criminal identified in the novel, which is the character Alberto Ruiz Tagle, who then later adopts the name of Carlos Vither. So the crime novel is um, one way to look at it. And another way is the focus on poetry and poetry workshops. Um, and writing in general, which, again, as in The Savage Detectives, is a topic that's shared in both of these novels. And it's almost as if one of the major crimes of the Pinochet coup d'etat of 1973 is the dissolution of groups of friends and writers, especially left-leaning friends and writers, who meet each other on a regular basis to write um, and talk about their own poetry with teachers who are very important in these young people's lives who then go on to have peripatetic and kind of fascinating post-coup histories. So you have uh, Juan Stein who actually becomes a guerrilla all over the world involved in Angola and in Central America, for example, and Diego Soto who's portrayed as kind of a non-political character who makes a very political brave act in a railroad station. Um, no spoilers here, but, uh, <laughs> and then suffers, you know, from, from that kind of bravery. So these teachers are also important um, after the workshop, but one of the crimes is the dissolution of this space of collaborative um, writing, reading, listening, and friendship. So those would be two, two basic approaches to this novel. Well, well let's start with the second. Um... Okay. Because the, as you say, the novel opens with this scene of uh, still before the coup under the Allende regime, uh, these students who, who come together informally, but it's not part of their, their studies, a part of the, the workshops with these mentors or, or teachers, mm -hmm. as you say, um, uh, to, to write. And and then, of course, this guy, Luis Tagli, uh -huh. comes in, and, and he is and he's not part of that right he already begins to some extent to disrupt that even before anything else happens and then and then with the coup everyone gets as you say dispersed and mm -hmm. and, and dissipated and, and Vida well Ruiz Tagle becomes Vida who's a very different kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of writer as well um but but yes say more about that uh, uh friendship and what happens to those friendships we we're talking earlier about the correspondence for instance, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, there's sort of tenuous links that take a while to fully dissolve, right? Mm -hmm. With uh, mm -hmm. We were talking about Bibiano before, for mm -hmm. instance. Right. So you, you learn fairly quickly over the course of reading the novel that the narrator is telling this story from more than 20 years later. Um, 
than the pre than the pre coup period that's portrayed at the very beginning. And you learn gradually this chronology that places the narrator and his good friend Bibiana Orion, who is one of the two or three people who attends both poetry workshops together, um, that they stay in Chile after the coup together for a while, but then the narrator leaves, but Bibiano stays in Chile. And they correspond for a very long time. And it's almost an obsession of Bibiano's to investigate the fate of Vider, um, this not really an interloper, but somebody who stands out in the poetry workshops as a person who has strange encounters, especially with um, Bibiano and another one of the poetry workshop members named Marta Posadas, who, as you mentioned, she's a medical student and she's in this poetry workshop, which takes place at the medical school, which is Diego Soto's workshop. And both of them have these uncanny encounters with um, Ruiz Tagle that occur in a context in which they know something else is going on that they can't quite understand and they know it's bad. Um, and Ruiz Tagle covers it up with this sort of smile when he opens the door for um, Bibiano and Marta Posadas gets a strange sense that the poetry he writes is not his own and that somehow he is communicating words of somebody else or he's somehow alienated from the poetry that he's telling. And um, just really briefly about how this chronology goes on, Bibiano's letters help the narrator track down Vider kind of, but then when Abel Romero shows up on the scene, tracking down Vider becomes an actual paid task. And we learn that Romero wants to become a funeral director after he gets paid for finding Vider. And he says that when you're a funeral director, you have to, to a degree, act as if the people who are being mourned were your own. But you can't overstep that bounds and actually pretend that they were your own. So I think there's a sense in which owning something or being foreign from something has to do with empathy and compassion in the case of Romero's sort of strange shift from being detective to funeral director. And somehow it doesn't work in Marta Posada's frightened surmisal of how Vida will become a very important poet. Um, but before then, she's concerned that his poetry is not his own. So there's an interesting relationship between mourning and empathy and ownership um, throughout the novel in that sense. And we were also talking about this before we started re recording. Um, uh, there's also the sense that this book itself is the product of some kind of collaboration. It's it's also a revision, right? So the, so the story comes is first, uh, or a, a very similar story, essentially the same story, mm -hmm. Uh, is is first found in a book called Nazi Literature in the Americas by Bologna, or, or also mm -hmm. in which, although the the principal, the protagonist has a different name and so on, but essentially it's the it, it's the same story, and and this is acknowledged in this little foreword or preface or, or mm -hmm. something in the final chapter of my novel Nazi Literature in the Americas. I recounted the story of Lieutenant Ramirez Hoffman, and then he talks about uh, a, a friend, a fellow Chilean, Arturo Bay. Mm -hmm. a veteran of Latin America's doom revolutions who says, you know, you haven't quite got it here. This isn't quite what, what's required. You have to t try again, uh, tell the story again. So, so that this, this, this book is prompted, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's though it's been part of a workshop, right? In which yeah. he's received some kind of feedback and, and he's trying again, returning to the, the story. Yeah, there's a couple there's a lot of interesting things related to that um, in that you have the poetry workshop as a site of collaboration, and then you have this revision of a shorter version of um, the story of Ramirez Hoffman, who then becomes Ruiz Tagla, who Carlos Vider, um, that's mentioned in the little foreword. And then you have over years of this kind of diffuse and confusing sometimes chronology of distant star, 
Bibiana writing letters to the narrator, who's never named, um, and wanting to trace what happened to important people after the coup, important for these characters, from the much more sympathetic, like Stein and Soto, to the mourned, like the Garmendia sisters, um, and Carmen Villagran, for example, to the feared and despised in the case of Vider. And it's really interesting that the novel sometimes uses the first person plural. You have a first person singular narrator who sometimes uses first person plural. And sometimes it seems like he's referring to himself and Bibiano kind of working together through this correspondence. But you could also imagine that it's the first person narrator and Arturo Bay kind of having a conversation. The novel has a really strong oral quality as if its narration were a conversation at times. And there's also the fact that Bibiano Orion in the novel publishes a book um, which in Spanish is called El Nuevo Retorno de los Brujos, or The New Return, which goes back to Vitor's name, and New Return is redundant, um, kind of, of the warlocks, let's say. And this is mm -hmm. a book about um, right-wing literature. So you have a sense that Bibiana Orion was actually the author of Literatura Nazi. And then finally, um, this kind of collaboration and these stories that Bibiano often tracks down and the narrator sometimes seems bored by, are have uncertain historical reference. There's not a strong sense that that they are true or that they could be they could be true, but they're very difficult to verify, let's say. And in the probably climactic scene of the novel, um, which is the photo exhibition in, in the borrowed apartment mm -hmm. by by Vider, there's a really interesting juxtaposition between uncertainty and ambivalence and certainty. So you have this novel that's a lot about uncertainty and ambivalence. And at one point it says, everything that I've just said could have happened that way. And on the same page, right before they describe the photo exposition, um, the narrator says, the photo exposition in the apartment, on the other hand, occurred exactly as I'm going to say. So there's a sense in which ambivalence and uncertainty are necessary products of collaboration and hearsay and correspondence and investigation in libraries and pseudonyms and everything else. And then there's a sense that there needs to be certainty about this depiction, this most crystal clear depiction of the crimes in the novel. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting play between collaboration and truth and certainty throughout. So, so perhaps this moves us towards the, the other theme or the other mm -hmm. element of the approach that you mentioned earlier, which is the crime fiction uh, mm -hmm. uh, section. Uh, again, I mean, you, you, you said earlier that the Bibiano Orion is in some ways a detective, but at the very end, we get a real detective, as it, as it were. Yeah. Uh, Abel Morano, um, um, Romero, mm -hmm. uh, a former police officer uh, who's now, as you say, a, a, a detective for hire, a, a private eye. But he can't do it on his own. So, so there's the collaborate. That's why he brings in. That's where the narrator comes in. And um, on the one, so that's a collaboration. And and the relationship between the two of them is interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that's all about certainty and truth and ambivalence too. They're trying to track down the okay, who is where, what's happened to Car the person who used to be Carlos Vida, who used mm -hmm. to be Ruiz Tagle, who now seems to have taken on other names as he goes through Europe, uh, uh, for instance, and an attempt by Romero or Romero's backer, who we never know who it is, the, right. the, the Romero's client, to put an end to something. And mm -hmm. and we don't quite, we, we know, but we don't know what happens, I guess, to Carlos Vida at the very end. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, that crime plot at, at the end and the relationship between Romero and the narrator. So um, Abel Romero is a character who appears, of course, in Savage, um, in Distant Star, but he also shows up very briefly in Savage Detectives. He has one entry in the middle section of Savage Detectives, which is a set of interviews that take place over almost 20 years. Um, and Romero describes in the Savage Detectives the difference between 
necessary or explicable violence, which he calls uh, causal, and contingent or accidental violence, which he calls casual. And in Savage Detectives, the Romero character says that explicable violence is something we can fight against. He says it's like two boxers in the ring at the same weight. But inexplicable or accidental violence is something that will destroy us. And the novel Distant Star talks about state crimes on a massive scale that are, of course, not limited to Chile and traces the process in which these crimes are condensed into one culprit, Carlos Vider. And there's kind of a fiction, perhaps, that if you could bring this man to justice or kill him, as is presumed um, quite strongly by the novel, that it would, like you said, put an end to something. Um, as if you could explain violence that's committed by one person. That would be the kind of explicable violence that you could put a stop to. And the cost of that committing that violence is something in return um, that you suffer yourself having committed it. And the narrator is clearly dissatisfied. And it's unclear whether Romero is satisfied. Um, right. Romero just seems to be in it for the money. And obviously Romero has a desire for revenge because he was a police officer under Allende. But there's a sense in which solving the crime that's committed by one individual barely scratches the surface of a context of massive state crimes that have destroyed an entire generation of Chileans, if not Latin Americans. Right. So, because the traditional detective novel, you know, Sherlock Holmes and so on and so forth, uh, my understanding is, is we normally think about it as there's been some kind of disorder. Right. And then the, the detective comes and uh, through reason with Sherlock Holmes or intuition or, or, or manages to restore order. Yes, the, the ending in, in some ways is very unsatisfying. It's certainly unsatisfying for the narrator, I, I think. It's not made explicit. And, uh, you, you know, you, you said earlier, I think, something about the it's a, it's a search for justice, but, but there's a sense that the justice has not, really been done perhaps could not be done um uh, and 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 yes what what has been lost which includes that whole scene of collaboration that whole scene of uh, of of people working and and reading and and thinking and and talking and writing uh, uh, together um cannot cannot be recuperated but again you were talking about this before the novel still tries to bring it back in 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 some way do you, perhaps you could say a little bit more uh, about that about the the way in which what the novel does to try to re recover something that otherwise is lost well to start with the figure of romero um and a way that the novel critiques the type of detective fiction you're describing where there's a moment of disorder that caused usually by a murder and then order um restored by the detective Romero is famous in Allende's Chile for having solved a locked room mystery um, by his wits and powers of observation. Um, so in the past, he was able to kind of fit the paradigm of the of the whodunits detective. Um, and the novel makes nods to Borges's sort of send ups of detective fiction. So clearly the novel is saying that the crime fiction, the traditional crime fiction model is not <laughs> sufficient to restore order or to um, bring about justice in, in, in the case of Chile and other places. But so there's a sense then in which you have to read things differently or challenge previous literary formulations or previous literary genres for the present. And you have the lost friendships, lost poetry workshops that the narrator doesn't suggest the possibility of returning to, but you do have a sense in which the kind of collaboration and the kind of dialogue um, that was taking place in the workshops has continued with his correspondence with Bibiano, with his conversation with Arturo Bellano, the collaborative narrator visible in the first person plural in the narrative. And 
a sense not only that this kind of collaborative writing, even with a generally first person narrator is necessary, but also the fact that what happened in Chile needs to be remembered. And there's one point um, in the novel where there's discussions of the possible trials against people like Vitor that don't go anywhere. And I believe that section is concluded with a sentence and Chile forgot it all. So there's a sense in which reminding people what happened in Chile has to be a collective effort and it cannot be an individual effort. And I think that's one way the collaborative spirit of the novel takes a lesson from the poetry workshop that is no longer um, recuperable. And then you were saying earlier also that this is not just about writing, this is also about reading. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things with Bolaño, also in other novels, in some ways he's writing, he just writes one big novel and it just happens yeah, to get this so, yeah. puzzle. puzzle. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the sort of Bolaño universe. But but so one of the things in, in, in Bolaño universe is of these writers who were never read, um, in the Savage Detectives, for instance, or or and and the but also about these people who are trying to, you know, who 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 are readers who who want mm -hmm. to uh in the in the savage detectives who track down this otherwise forgotten uh, uh poet mm -hmm. uh, but also in, in in this book you you were saying that one of the changes one of the things that happens which seems to be lamented to to some extent in the book is a decline in in, in reading I, I wonder if you could you could talk about that and about the importance of reading for the book and for Bolaño perhaps okay so after the coup, Bibiano Orion, who writes all kinds of letters to the narrator and does all kinds of reading in archives and libraries, becomes a shoe salesman in a part of Santiago or Concepcion, I can't remember, um, where the number of secondhand bookstores is steadily declining. And there's a sense that people are reading less. And as any reader of Bolaño will know, there are references to all kinds of authors, most of whom are real, but some of whom are invented. And there's a funny part where they talk about one of Bolaño's um, admired writers, who is Nicanor Parra, the Chilean poet, who wrote a series of poems called Artefactos, which are these visual poems on index cards that he sold in a box set. And I believe it's Diego Soto, or it could have been Juan Stein, writes to Parra, um, criticizing the vulgarity of one of the jokes on the artefactos. And, and supposedly Parra writes back on one of the postcard-sized artefactos and says, well, no one reads. But as a student or a reader of Bologna, you find yourself inspired to look up these writers that you may have never heard of. And so there's a sense in which Bologna's texts, at one, at one, in one hand, on one hand, say you need to read these other things. But on the other hand, they do exist pretty well on their own, so you you don't have to enjoy you don't have to read them in order to enjoy Bologna, but there is a sense that you have to keep reading. And at one point, um, Bibiano contacts a certain Graham Greenwood, who's a kind of a scholar of conspiracy theories and other. He's a Philip K. Dick scholar also in the United States. And he says you have to develop a new way of reading where you have to decipher all kinds of different sorts of details. So throughout a lot of Bologna's texts, there are certain kinds of strange fringe creatures or characters um, who promote a sort of paranoid style of reading where you have to decipher almost everything. And Bologna doesn't suggest that that's um, the answer, but that's an exaggerated version of the experience of reading Bologna himself, which I, at least in my experience, and I think in many others, has led readers to continue reading beyond his texts, inspired by the references that he constantly makes to other writers. Beyond his text, but also to more Bolaño. We, we were talking before also about yeah. how immensely productive That's... Bolaño was in yeah. the last few years of his life and how these threads... So, you know, this might lead you to um, Nazi liter literature in the Americas. It might lead yeah. you to... Um, the savage detectives tracing the yeah. threads of of yeah. the, what they share, both their preoccupations, individual characters, individual stories that, that, that repeat. He wants you to keep reading. Yeah, and he, I think, he wants you to keep reading his own works, which then always 
And I, this is the name of Chris Andrews's book, which is a really great book, The Expanding Universe. I mean, it does always it does always keep expanding. Um, and then the other case of a character like Ruiz Tagle is the main character of Amulet, who's um, first talked about in Savage Detectives. And then she, of course, has a lot of Spanish exiled artists and poets around her, which would then inspire readers perhaps to look them up. Um, and then one more thing about this is as I said before, some of the writers Bologna refers to are invented. And then some of the characters, of course, are invented, but then some of the actual things that happen to the characters are true. So it's not that it might inspire people to, it's not only that it might inspire people to read other poets or fiction writers, but to investigate the historical um, events that Bologna depicts, um, such as the main character of Amulet being an actual an actual person. Okay, well, we're, we're, there's much more we could say, but I think we're out of time. We had a few internet glitches as well, which may or may not have shown up at one point of the video. But this has been another uh, excellent conversation. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for sharing your time and expertise on Bolaño and on Distant Star. No, thank you, John. I really enjoyed it a ton. And it was great to, to look at this book again, which I am going to teach to my students next week. So this has been helpful and wonderful in many ways. So thanks again. I really enjoyed it.